Fortunately, when they needed it the most, a local boy from Swampscott, Massachusetts, stepped to the plate for his first at-bat at Fenway Park. Tony Canigliaro was 19 years old. There's a drive by Canigliaro, and it is out of here. What a bomb he is. Canigliaro hits a home run his first time at bat at Fenway Park. This was just the beginning of the fairy tale script. Canigliaro hit 24 home runs that season, despite missing six weeks with an assortment of injuries. In 1965, his 32 home runs made him the youngest player ever to lead either league in home runs. And he gets a tremendous hand. What a thrill that must be for a 19-year-old boy who a year ago was playing high school baseball. Look at that smile on his face. <laughs> I guess not. How about when impressionable Red Sox fans needed a breath of fresh air, Tony C. provided it. He was Boston's baseball answer to the Beatles, a ball player who dabbled as a matinee idol. On a September afternoon in 1965, 22-year-old Dave Moorhead juggled a ball hit to him. Upon gaining control, he completed the Red Sox third no-hitter in four years. I said to Tillman, what are we gonna throw the count so into? He says, I'm not calling this pitch, you're calling this pitch, you're telling me what we're gonna throw. So I said, man, we're going to throw a curveball low and in, and hopefully I'll chase it. And hit a ground ball back to me, and I dropped it, and it was going to run over to first base. And uh, everybody started screaming, and it was back on the mound, so I had to run back and pick it up real quick, and I threw hurriedly to first, threw it in the dirt. And Lee Thomas, thankfully, uh, uh, scooped it out for the final out. Because the 1965 Red Sox finished a whopping 40 games out of first place, the 1966 Red Sox were essentially playing before family and friends. We had no one at the ballpark. I think the most we would do was like 800,000, 700,000, something like that. And it wasn't fun. But in 66, the second half of the year, we started to turn it around. I think we played better than 500 ball. Uh, we had a marked improvement from 65. We only lost 99 games. <laughs> so, but it was an improvement in the second half. Then they decided to make a make a managerial change in uh, 67 of course Dick Williams came on the scene Dick will you make a prediction for the 1967 Red Sox I honestly think we'll win more ball games than we lose those were words spoken by brash rookie manager Dick Williams about the 1967 Red Sox, a team that was a 100 to 1 shot to be in the World Series. For this was the same team that the year before had barely escaped last place in the 10 team American League. We were tired of losing. I mean, really tired of losing. We just wanted to do anything we could do to win games. Dick came with a real good attitude, uh, an aggressive attitude. Uh, made us understand that the, we had to do the little things, the bunting, the hit and run, not just the home run, you know, and get good pitching and defense. So if you made an error, I'll tell you, you heard about it. Other than the hiring of Dick Williams as manager, the other crucial off-season move was made by Carl Yastrzemski, who underwent a rigorous workout regimen. He decided he needed to get stronger. He lived in Linfield at the time. Gene Birdie was a trainer up at Colonial in Linfield. He went to the guy, and the guy, Worked him out all off season, made him bigger. I almost walked out on him, but then my competitive nature said, I'm gonna show this guy. And he just helped me tremendously. He put me in tremendous physical shape. All of a sudden, uh, he had greater bat speed. Uh, he could pull the ball, change his stance a little bit. And uh, next year he had 44 home runs. No nonsense manager Williams took to umpiring spring training interest squad games. He was clearly in charge. Dick Williams came in and, and really changed the atmosphere. Um, you know, as he's been quoted as saying, he was the only chief and everybody else were, were the Indians. And Very high toward the flagpole area, Unser back, looking up, it is gone. Home run. But what nobody anticipated is that Carl Yastrzemski had undergone a transformation from a struggling rookie to a good player. Until in 1967, he became Captain Carl, a baseball superman. We went down to Yankee Stadium. Whitey Ford is pitching, making his 432nd Major League start. And Rohr is making his first. Red Sox bench, Bill Rohr. In the ninth inning, Tom Tresh led off. 
And he hit a fly ball to left field, and he has made one of the greatest catches that I've ever seen. And uh, and I said so. <laughs> Laura winds. Here it comes. Fly ball to deep left. Jastrzemski is going hard. Way back. And he does. That catch saved Billy Roar's bid for a no-hitter in his Major League debut. When I was running back, uh, my back was completely at uh, home plate. I never really saw the ball until the last split second over my shoulder. And how I caught it, I, I really don't know. And I knew uh, I wanted to save the no-hitter. And as I dove and caught the ball, it's the only thing that I thought of about saving the no-hitter for Bill Roar. I was aware of what was going on, and then when, when Carl made that unbelievable catch in the ninth inning, that really just kind of put an exclamation point on what was on what was going on. With Roar one out away from a no-hitter, Yankees catcher Elston Howard came to the plate. Face him! I've been haunted, I suppose, if that's the right word, for, for three decades now about that, but... I do recall Elston getting first base and the Yankee fans were vocal in their displeasure. And the fans were throwing those rented cushions and they were throwing uh, paper cups. Elston Howard, I think, said that that's the first time he'd ever gotten a hit in Yankee Stadium and got booed for the trouble. Popped up, Finigliero, plenty of room. Makes the play, the ball game's over. Roar's one hitter was the first flicker signaling that 1967 was going to be a different year. With the emergence of several young players, including George Scott, New England became captivated by the team and began dreaming the impossible. That we decided we would make a recording, an audio recording, and a television show. And uh, this is how it began. This is truly a love story, an affair twixt a town and a team, a town that had waited and waited for what seemed an impossible dream. Due to its penchant for late game wins, the team became known as the Cardiac Kids. And the Red Sox have won it in 15 innings. The Red Sox pull it out 11 to 10 and go into a tie for first place in the American League as Jose Tarnable is mobbed by his teammates going off.